know what that music means. It's another special episode of Uncorking a Story. And I'm your host, Mike Carlin. And today, we have the second part of my interview with Jim Carlin with you. And if that name sounds familiar, uh, you know, it should, because hopefully you listen to part one. <laughs> Jim is uh, my twin brother. And if you haven't listened to part one yet, uh, I'm going to suggest that you stop listening right now, go back, listen to the post uh, from Tuesday. My uh, first half, uh, the first half of the interview I did with my brother Jim about his book, uh, Conversation with a Desperate Man. And actually, <laughs> the other day, I think I may have called it Confessions of a Desperate Man. <laughs> may have been a better title. Who knows? Um, but to go back and listen to that first episode if you haven't done so already, because it'll this episode will make a lot more sense, of course, if you did. Now, uh, this second episode picks up from uh, Jim joining the military. And he did that um, at 39. You, you'll hear that story. I, I'm not going to tell that story for him. You'll hear it here. But to me, this marks a, a very critical part of his life and, and a very critical part of the story because you know, the first part of the interview from the other day, we were really discussing you know, how, how much of a hard time Jim had putting himself first. He was always putting other people first and he had a very difficult time and it led to a lot of conflict, to be honest with you, to to put himself first, uh, given uh, a little we'll just characterize them as environmental circumstances, given environmental circumstances. You know, it, uh, that, that, that's all I'll say about it. But, um, you know, when he decided to join the military, he did that for himself. He did that because it was a dream he's had for a very long time. He was prevented from doing so due to a medical condition. Again, you'll hear him tell the story. But, you know, he could have easily said, you know what? I can't do it. I'm too old. I've got too much other responsibility right now. But he didn't do that. And that led to some negative consequences for him. Uh, you'll hear about that, too. But uh, to me, that's the real turning point of his story, which is why I wanted to separate it from from the other, you know, from the other interview. So he here we go. Um, you know, we're about to hear Jim talk about his time in the military and the impact that had on his life. Thanks for listening. Well, you know, you mentioned something before about joining the military, and I think that's a very important part of, of your story. So tell me, actually tell us a little bit more uh, about that, because I think we need a little bit more context on joining the military at 39 or 40 years of age um, and, and the role that that may have played in, um, you know, uh, why this book was, was written. Yeah. Um, so when I was in law school, I mean, the, the quick story is I was in law school and uh, I, w I wanted to be a JAG officer. That was what I wanted to do. That's why I went to law school. That's what my my passion was and was kind of the picture that I had in my, my head that whole time. But the problem was I had uh, disqualifying medical conditions uh, dating back to early childhood that just would not, could not be waived at the time. And I remember working with my law school professors to try and, you know, interpret the uh, regulations, the various armed services to, to see if there was a way for me to get in. I had a very successful interview with an army JAG recruiter actually in law school and I was at the top of my class. So what would happened, I think, um, but you have this underlying medical and, and, and this just, just again, you were in law school, um, but you weren't married while you were in law school. No, you were certainly no. with the woman who you were going to marry right. at the time. Was she aware of your desire to join the military, join the JAG Corps? I mean, yes and no. I mean, we weren't even engaged at the time. So, I mean, I, I'm sure I probably mentioned it in some capacity. Um, but, you know, I, I was obviously trying to figure out what my career was going to be. And I, you know, it was, it was the 90s, right? So it was the 90s. Uh, the World Trade Center <laughs> was still standing. We were not on a, a war footing. And, um, you know, as a result of that, the accession into the military was extremely strict. After we went in uh, to Afghanistan and then eventually into Iraq, uh you know, as I say in the book, Uncle Sam needed more bodies to throw at the problem. He just did. And so um, anyway, just just to get back to your, your question, I, I could not assess into 
uh, the the JAG Corps to the Army JAG Corps when I was in law school. It just wouldn't happen. Yeah. Um, having said that, uh, people who know me, um, you know, they 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 know this about me. When I get something in my head, and and I have something that that I want, and this is by the way it in conflict with me being a very supplicative uh, person who de-emphasizes his wants, needs, and desires. So just, I mean, human beings are complicated. What can I tell you? Um, but people who know me know that when I get something in my head and I want to do something, I, I don't really let it go. I don't let it go. So, you know, eventually I get engaged. Um, I, I get married. I, I, I take jobs at, you know, fairly large law firms, you know, to, to make as much money as I can. All the while, I know that this is not, you know, I, I've kind of betrayed this image, but I, 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 that I have in my head, but I rationalize it because hell, I'm disabled for the military's purposes. And now I have a life and, and, a, and, a, and a wife and a, and a child eventually, um, when my, my older son was born. And so life just kind of happens, you know, you just, and this is a very common story for a lot of people. Life happens. And, and those, those dreams, uh, they, they fall by the wayside uh, for me and this right, wrong or otherwise, I, I the dream doesn't go, <laughs> it doesn't go very easily anyway. And then the dream's still there. And so what happens, what happens is uh, our country gets attacked in 2001 and I think it's by 2010, 2011, it was 2013, 2012. I can't really remember. The armed services eventually changes their medical regulations. And, and they say that if you're able to get off of Medicaid, 2010, pardon me, I'm, I, I really apologize. Uh, if you're able to get off of whatever medication you're taking to treat this otherwise disqualifying medical condition, and you can go off that medication for a period of, of five years, um, then you can assess into the armed services. And just in for context, the, the, the condition is asthma. Yes, I had asthma and, and like chronic bronchitis was another. There's a lot of like, I mean, asthma is kind of the big one, but then, you know, the military's got all these little subsets of, of conditions that you uh, you have to satisfy. And I, I used to go on medication for bronchitis like seasonally, like I would get bronchitis almost every year um, and I'd have to take prednisone or for some drug to, to treat the bronchitis. So yeah, it was asthma and chronic bronchitis and respiratory illness in general. Yeah. So uh and I know my dates are a little screwy, Louie. Here, I apologize, but 2000. I can, I can tell you, no one's fact checking this. Jim. <laughs> okay, good. 2009 or 2010. I'm having a conversation with my doctor, and we were talking about my medication protocol. And he says, "Go on this." And you know, a lot of people take. I think it was Advair or something. A lot of people take this, and then we take you off of it. And what you generally find is that people need less and less and less of the other medication. Like once you've been on this cycle for a while and it kind of sinks in, again, I don't know what the physiology is of any of this, but this is my recollection. Um, you may very well need much less medication. So of course he says that to me and I say, well, if I need less medication, maybe I won't need any medication. Right. So um, I'm on the Advair for, you know, eight, nine, 10 months, whatever it was. And eventually I take myself off of it, keep going to the doctor and I'm not taking anything else. He's not writing a single prescription for me. Uh, there's nothing else coming down the pike from the pharmacy. I'm not taking any medication at all. And, you know, I was a kid who couldn't run down the block without, you know, sucking on an inhaler. So this was kind of like a big deal. Um, and, you know, I remember Mr. Sharing, he yeah. named your inhalers like a weirdo. Well, whatever. And, you know, I'm running down the street. I'm, I'm jogging at the time. Then I'm running and I'm running longer. And I, I just keep working at it. And uh, yeah, eventually, I mean, in the blink of an eye, five years goes by. And I realize, hell, I, had, I haven't taken any medication in five years. This is pretty cool. So, um, you know, at that point, I'd been through a bunch of job changes. You know, the, the yeah, my experience in the law was kind of rocky because we had gone through the financial crisis and 2008. And, you know, I was hitting plateau after plateau at work. Then I, I finally wound up um, 
going back to a, a job that I had left years ago because of, of a horrible work environment that I was experiencing, but I was offered a kind of a, a promotion and a significant salary raise to go back to that job, which I really didn't want to do. But you know, I didn't have didn't really have a choice. I had to provide for my Wait family. Minute. Talk to me a little bit more about why you had to do it because well, I, no one had a gun to your head saying, hey, go back to this firm that you didn't enjoy being at. I know you're, you're right. But, um, you know, with the firm I was at was downsizing attorneys. My pay got, got hit pretty hard because of, again, because of the financial crisis and the aftermath thereof. And uh, I felt like I felt like I needed to to make that shift and go back to that environment because I, you know, I felt like I needed to provide for my my kids. And it was kind of all on me to do it at the time. So I, I made that decision. But that was right around the same time where, you know, I had about one more year to go on my journey to get drug free for five years. And I said, all right, you know what, if I go back and I have to do this and I have to endure this environment, then I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to take this year and I'm really going to think about whether I'm going to make this happen. And, and to be clear, just so people understand, it, I was not going to go full-time active duty into the military. I was going to be a reservist and I was going to sort of have my civilian career and then go on active duty when I needed to and then come back. So I was going to keep my civilian job as it were. Um, but at the time I made a deal with myself because I said, you know, I have to go back to this environment that I really didn't, I had really bad experiences. I still had bad memories, almost like you can say emotional flashbacks uh, to, to having worked in that environment before because of some of the people that I had to endure in that environment. But I was going back, but I said, okay, if I have to do this, or at least I say I have to do this to myself, then I'm going to really think long and hard about whether I'm going to let the dream go right? I, I'm, I'm going to think long and hard about whether I'm going to let this opportunity that was a few months away from being realized once I had cleared that medical hurdle, uh, I was going to think long and hard about letting that go. And, and ultimately, you know, again, did not to give everybody a long story, but in 2014, um, after a lot of soul searching and, you know, talking to dad, <laughs> actually, he was one of the ones who really encouraged me to follow through on this because, you know, he knew how many concessions, how many uh, compromises, how many times I had not looked out for myself and, and put everybody before me. He knew that because when you're old enough, you can see it. You know, you just can. That's that's where wisdom comes from. And he pulled me aside he did probably like a mile and a half away from here. We're at a diner <laughs> where I'm sitting right now. And he said, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. And yeah, it's going to cause problems. And she's probably going to get really upset. But you got to decide who you're living for. I mean, you're always going to provide for your family. You're never going to not do that. You know, you're not going to live the born to run song, right? You're going to leave and not come back. Um, but who are you living your life for is really what he asked me. And, uh, and I answered <laughs> that question. And there were a lot, of, a lot of difficult times ahead after I answered that question. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're really set yourself up for some major life conflict at this point, right? Yeah. You've got this, you've got this dream which you never gave up on and it's within your grasp. It's mm -hmm. being offered to you. You can take it. Yep. You've got this toxic work environment you're going back to. And I imagine that, you know, taking, you, you, you need to take it months of your time off in order to go through the training for the JAG Corps. Oh yeah. So that's going to lead to conflict with the employer. I would imagine. Yes. And the big conflict uh, coming from the home front, meaning, You've always been the one that, you know, was kind of number one, you're, you are the provider, number one. Number two, you've always been kind of a, a, a yes person. You've always um, kind of done whatever you need to do to not rock the boat. Mm -hmm. But you're about to make a decision that's not just going to rock the boat. I mean, it's going to be like a tsunami on the boat. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, I think um, if I remember correctly, the way the way I describe it in the book is I, I didn't throw a pebble in the pond. I threw a boulder. I mean, I just pushed that boulder off the cliff and it it smashed right into the center of that pond and just created a, a tsunami, as you as you uh, 
correctly pointed out. Yeah. I mean, Mike, I, I threw myself off the ledge and I didn't know where it was all going to end, but I knew I couldn't just stay where I was. I, I had to, I, I had to do this for myself. Um, for, for a lot of reasons, you know, I mean, that, that could be a whole episode, I guess, like psychologically why I felt like I needed to, to do it, but, um, but so I did it. Just pause for a second, because to me, this is like a really big breakthrough moment for you mm-hmm. because, you know, you, you had been so hesitant to, to be a boat rocker yeah. yet, you know, you kind of stayed strong and said, I am, you didn't ask for permission. No, you, you said, I am doing this and you, yeah. knew, you knew what was about to happen. And maybe you weren't prepared for, you know, what, what, what went into action after you, after you left. Yeah. Um, and, and how that would continue throughout, you know, the, the remainder of, of your marriage and maybe even to today. But, you know, the, to me, it's just like hearing this story, you know, I, I know, of course I know the story, but just hearing it, kind of shape like this. It's like, this was your moment to, you know, start taking those steps to say, you know what? I have needs. I have dreams. I'm important in this relationship. And even if it's going to cause trouble, I need to do this for me. And you did. Yes. Yes, I did. I did. And uh, again, as, as you point out, not, not without consequences. And, you know, in retrospect, cause I can look back and I, I can think about all the years of conflict, all the years of concession before that, all the stuff that was going on with work and, and, and then the input I was getting from my family. Cause you know, I went and talked to dad about this. I talked to, you know, our sister about it. I talked to you about it and, and I kind of framed it for everybody and they all looked at me because they, you know, people know, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that I hope that people who read this book, if, if they're not at the place where I was, and I, I really hope most people are not, <laughs> I really do. But if they read the book, what they'll, what I hope they take away with is, is the power that friends and family have, um, the influence they can have on somebody and, and the real significant role that they play in, in their loved one's life. And uh, for me, like I had everybody in, in our nuclear family uh, telling me, hey, you know, this is a shot. And, it, you know, I know that the family's not going to like it. I mean, my kids were petrified, of course, which is horrible. I and mean, it was horrible to to see them uh, cry and and the anguish that they had. It was it was awful. And uh, I know they were worried about me, but in some ways, Mike, you know, they were also worried about losing that kind of um, that balance at home. They they lost the person who was providing. The, the stabilization, you know, like I, again, I, I, I refer to myself this way in, in the book as like the band manager, you know, the guy who's got to make sure that the green M&Ms are in the, in the bowl in the dressing room and, and takes care of all the needs to keep the band together. Cause if one thing goes wrong, you know, the band's going to start fighting and, and the band could eventually split up. And I was hell bent for years on keeping the band together. So I think, I think my kids, were going to miss me, of course, and they were going to be concerned about me. But I think they're also worried about losing the band manager, if I had to guess. Um, but yeah, I this was a big, big change and a big, it, it was pretty dramatic. Like this wasn't like I'm going to the anniversary party, right? I'm going to go to the family reunion in Cape Cod, which I missed, of course. Um, this was like a major deal. And I guess I had just reached a point a kind of a breaking point, Mike. I was like, to hell with this. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to let it go. Sorry. You can have anything you want, but this, this is mine. And I'm, I'm not going to, not going to give it up. Yeah. Right, wrong, or right, wrong, or otherwise, by the way, because I, I know if people listen to this and say, my God, this is a major life decision. You make this unilaterally, like, are you crazy? You know, and I get it. And I'm, I'm open to the criticism. I, I get it. But um, again, I, 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 w- I didn't let it go. So you you go down to uh, was it Georgia, right? <laughs> yeah, Fort Benning, Georgia. Yeah. Now starting, you know, joining the military at eighteen is hard, hmm. right? There's a lot of uh, physical training and mental training too. Yeah, that that goes into you know becoming 
a member of, of the United States Armed Forces. Doing it at 18 is hard. Doing it at 40 has got to be harder. Yeah, it was hard on on a number of levels. I mean, uh, it, actually, you know, it's funny because I was thinking like my personality maybe made it a little bit easier because I wasn't some like well-established. I mean, I was a fairly well-established lawyer, but I wasn't like some guy who thought that he could walk in there with all that, all those years of life experience and professional experience. And all of a sudden I'm going to be the general, right? Um you know, I, I didn't have that. I was more than willing to start from scratch. I was more than willing to sit side by side with, you know, kids, you know, 23, 24, 25 years old and take orders from, from people who often were were younger than me, you know, like, uh, that's that's the way it is. Uh, and I was more than willing to do that. So from that perspective, I guess maybe my personality helped me, helped me through it, but you're quite right. I mean, I think in the best case scenario, okay. The best case scenario where, you know, my family has a uh, good luck dad signs and balloons and there's a cake and, you know, there there's uh, cookies and stuff on my way out the door, um, of which there were none, by the way. But I'm saying like in the best case scenario, it would have been tough because, you know, you're, you're 39, 40 years old is a hell of a lot different than 25. And everybody who's in their 40s now knows what I'm talking about. Um you know, you feel different. You're not the same. Uh, and, you know, waking up at five in the morning and, you know, working, you know, or in training for, you know, 13, 14 hours a day, physical, mental, the whole thing. It's not easy. It's not easy. Um, what made it exponentially worse was the fact that, you know, I was getting like angry messages, angry phone messages, angry text messages, angry notes and emails about how I had abandoned the family and what a horrible dad I was, you know, and that that was kind of bookending each day of of basic training. So that that was the worst part. I mean, the rest of the stuff, like I wrote about in the book, I had some struggles at basic training, but I got through it because uh, my, my fellow soldiers didn't let me fail, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. God, I think... Got a little moment there. Uh, you know, they, they didn't let me fail, but um, you can pause. You can pause, Jim. Yeah, sorry. Because in in um, you know, in a perfect world, you know, you with somebody who who says they love you, you know, they the response, you know, in my in my head should have been, hey, I know this is going to be hard on us. I know your dream is important to you. Um, don't worry about a thing at home. Yeah, you do what you need to do. Now, in my head. And of course, that's like that's like the, the Disney version of it, right? That's the that's the and I'm sure that you know it, it, probably for nobody is it that maybe that simple, but but that's that's the way it should be. Uh-huh. So now let's let's just I'm just gonna do what I do, which is kind of pause and rewind a little bit. But you you've got um, your age kind of working against you here because right. you are you're in your 40s and and you're taking orders from people younger than you. Our bodies are you know, they don't recover like they did No, when we were, when we were 20, I, I know this as a, as a runner, you know, I go out for a long run at, at 46. I don't recover the same way I did when I was 18. No, man. So, and, and, and we're not talking about just running here. Obviously there, there's a lot more physical training that goes into um, certainly your, your basic training. Yeah. Um, so you've got a lot of hard, every day is a hard day, right? The only easy day was yesterday kind of thing happening in your training. Yeah. And, you know, but, but coming from home, it's, you know, so you're getting beaten down. I mean, you're getting built up. I'd say you're getting built up in your physical training, but you're getting kind of beaten down interpersonally, you know, from, from, from the home front. How, how hard was that? It's very, very difficult, Mike. Um, I mean, I, I remember like, I, like I'd have Saturdays off, you know, from, from training and I'd be sitting there like icing my knees and stuff in the bed and, and just, you know, guys would see me cause you know, like I, it, you develop friendships pretty quickly because you're all going through this very intense experience and you sort of bond with people a lot faster. And I've always, for some reason, I've always been able to make friends pretty quickly, which I'm you know, very blessed to have that uh, trait, I guess. But um, you know, the guys would come up to me and, and, the, and the women too. We were a mixed, you know, mixed group. And I'll never forget my, my roommate, uh, Ian Stam, Captain Ian Stam now captain said to me, you know, said you, you're, 
you need to focus on what you're doing here. And I'm sorry that she's not supporting you, but it's really starting to affect you. You know, I was having trouble with some, you know, most of basic training a lot of basic training is physical, right? So you're marching, you're hiking, you're running, you're shooting weapons and doing that sort of thing. But there's a lot of, a lot of mental, there's a mental part of it too. And he could see that I was distracted and I wasn't absorbing things the way that I should, because I was, you know, I was distracted with uh, what's going on at home. It's like, you know, there were two things that were occupying my mental and emotional energy. It was basic training, but it was also all the stuff happening at the house that I was sort of, you know, I was getting every every morning and every night in, in these messages, and uh, and and he was the first one to to you know come up to me and say you you gotta you gotta figure this out. Um, and and I knew what he, in retrospect, like if you asked him today, because we're still good friends, you know, he was sending the clear message. <laughs> clear message was, dude, uh, this is an anchor. Like you have to swim across the English Channel. That's what you have to do. That's what this whole process is. This process is you swimming across the English Channel, and you're doing it at age 40, and you're doing it with a 300-pound anchor tied around your ankle. That's how you're swimming across the English Channel, and and it's not going to work. It's not going to work. He was the first one to point that out. I mean, outside of my family, he was the first one to point that out. So you get through, uh, we're just going to jump ahead a little bit here. You, you, you kind of get through basic training, you graduate, um, you're a uh, uh, second lieutenant. I'm first lieutenant. Yeah. First, first lieutenant. You, yeah. you eventually, you know, rise to the rank of captain. So mm-hmm. You've got, you know, you've got your military career going and it's, yeah. it, it sounds like it, it brought you, I know it brought you a great amount of satisfaction but then, you know, there's these other two forces in your life, again, that are still out there, right? So you've got issues, you know, with the job, you know, your your day job as a lawyer. Of course, you've got, um, you know, repercussions at home. Uh, let's go back to the job for a minute. How, if at all, did your, do you believe that your uh, life in the military, your, your, your choice to, to be a reservist, uh-huh. impacted what was happening to you at work? Well, let me say this. Um, first of all, um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a one dimensional process at, at, at work. Um, they, they, they did support me. So when I was gone, you know, they, they kept all my benefits in place and even paid my, my compensation while I was gone. Like, so my civilian pay, continued net my military pay. So I didn't lose any income while I was gone. That's a huge deal. And that's not something that every employer does. And it's not something that any employer has to do, at least under the current laws. They, they don't have to continue your pay and they don't have to continue your benefits. So I am forever grateful that my employer continued that because that allowed me to have more stability at home. So imagine like you go from you know, a partner in a law firm his compensation uh, to a, to his uh, first lieutenant. I mean, it's a pretty significant difference. Um, but having said that, um, I, I had to spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours a year not billing time and working in the military. I mean, I just did. Um, we, we were, I mean, we were still in Afghanistan, right? We were still in Iraq. Um, it was drawing down relatively significantly. So my risk of, of a call up was not as significant as it otherwise would have been in years past, but it was still present. And North Korea was giving us problems at the time. I mean, during my, my tenure as an officer. So there was always that risk as well. And we were on the alert roster many, many times um, during my uh, my career in the reserves, uh, where I mean, it could have been a matter of weeks, and we would have been called up. It just it was always hanging over your head. Um, but you know, work. I, whatever problems I was having regarding you know the origination issue, for example, yeah, sure, it 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 remained, and it got 
it got worse because I wasn't there as much and I didn't have the same ability to focus on, you know, client origination and client development and marketing because I always had this other master tugging at me and and I, I had to do what I had to do. And on the one hand, you know, they were grateful and appreciative of it, you know, and, 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 and all of that. But at the end of the day, what matters is kind of what you're bringing to the table. So it didn't help that situation. And in retrospect, like I get it. I mean, it's a business. It's based on numbers. Um, Unfortunately, it's not people, it's numbers. And that's just the way that it is uh, under the best of circumstances. But these other issues that are happening there where I'm, I'm losing credit for the work that I am actually able to generate is a big problem. You know, it's a really big problem. So, so that, that, that certainly created issues at work, Mike. There's no doubt about it. And I have to accept that. I take responsibility for it. I, I made the decision. No, nobody forced me to do it. Okay. So th- let's talk about uh, repercussions at home. So now you're home. Uh, you still have to serve, what was it, a week, at least a weekend a month and, and two weeks a year. Well, yeah, that's the commercial. Yeah, that's the commercial. The reality, well, the reality is rather different, but that's the commercial. Okay. Well, I, I, you know, that's what I'm referencing. Is the yeah, I gotcha. So um, tell me about home and, and how accepting, now that you're home, I mean, you know, things, things must have stabilized, right? Now that you're, you're home more. Uh, no, no, not really. Uh, because every time that I would, I would put that uniform on and it happened with some regularity was, was time that, that, um, I was not spending at home. Uh, was time. Are you allowed to wear the uniform in the house? Generally speaking, when I would go to reserve duty, I would leave very, very early in the morning. So I would be able to get my uniform on early and, and leave the house before anybody woke up. But when I would come back from reserve duty, whether I came back on, on a Saturday and then went back to duty on Sunday, or I was gone for the whole weekend, um, I would, I would change my uniform in, uh, like, uh, gas stations or rest stops so that I didn't have to wear the uniform around the kids because, you know, she didn't want me to wear the uniform around the kids. What, what so, was the rationale for that? Why, why would, I, why, I, why would it have been so bad for your children to see you in the uniform? I think that, um, again, I, I don't want to speak for somebody else. I got to walk a line here, but I, my impression, my impression was that number one, it was a reminder of, of a very you know painful time for, for her and, and for the kids that, you know, when I was gone on, on active duty training for six months, I mean, it's a painful time. Uh, secondly, you know, it was just a reminder. It was a rem- reminder that I had made this decision that, that I had started to crack that shell just a little bit and was doing something that, you know, nobody really wanted me to do. I mean, within that particular household. Uh, but I, I was doing it just for myself. I mean, I, I was doing it. Listen, I don't do anything just for me. I mean, I, it's not really true, but I mean, there's always a reason. I mean, I, I, I did it because I, I wanted to serve our country. I wanted to take care of, of, of my soldiers who, who I care deeply about. And, and, you know, I had, what I write about in the book, I had those three examples growing up, you know, our, our two granddads and, and dad. And that's, that, that was the, that was the motivating factor, you know, but, well, but it, it, just, to, just to reflect on that for a second, Jim, it, it's not just them who you're doing it for. It's not just you who you're doing it for. In a way you also do it for your children because, you know, you need to send them the message that there are things in life that are going to be important to you and even if they're not as important as somebody else, if they are that important to you, then you have to stand up for yourself and and say that. You have to, and then your behavior has to follow. So in a way, even though it was tough on the kids to not have you there as often, of course, as you were, um, you're also sending the message that, hey, things. this is important to me. I need to go for it. And that's that's a message that, that they need to have too, because if their if their only example of you is, um, hey, nothing's nothing's important to me. I always have to put um, uh, everyone else first. Then that's that behavior to mo- that modeling that behavior is is not good for them either. 
No, I mean, you're hundred percent right. And uh, in retrospect, you're absolutely, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Um, that, 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 that's something, I mean, Hey, look, uh, I, I could also give them the example of being Dan Bilzerian, right? I could go hang around on a boat with, with a bunch of women and champagne and the whole thing. And I'm doing that for myself, right? But I think this example is hopefully a little more noble. Um, you know, it, it, it was about, it's about self-sacrifice, but, you know, like eventually what, what happens in the military, and again, I'm not claiming to be an expert with this, but just my my perspective on it, it's you go in for these big reasons and the, these very kind of noble purposes. You stay in because you want to take care of, of your guys or, or your gals. You, you, want to, you want to take care of your soldiers. You want to be with them. You want to struggle with them. You want to um, accomplish things with them and, and take care of them. That's why you stay, you know, and I agree with you. I, I think, I think it was important to send them that message. I, I think, I think my older son definitely gets it, <laughs> definitely gets it. Uh, my younger guys, may, maybe not so much, at least not now, but, um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Mike. So, uh, I want to get to the point where, where this kind of began, you know, we, we started talking about your time in, um, a psychiatric hospital, or at least getting to the point where you said, Hey, I need, you know, you were mentioning, Hey, you know, your body tells you it's breaking down and it needs help and you're not making a choice to go there. You have to go there. Um, eventually you do wind up in, in a hospital. Um, tell me what that experience was like and, and kind of what, what happened there that, that, you know, transformed you. You know, I, I was just thinking to myself, Mike, um, as you were asking that question that I think this might be the first time on your podcast where you're talking about a book that you're actually in, <laughs> you actually play a, a major role in this book. No, but you know, people should know. I mean, you're the one who, who picked me up that day uh, in, in New Canaan and, and drove me to, to the hospital where I, I spent, you know, a week in, in kind of intensive uh, psychiatric care. Um, you know, um, it, <laughs> I think that looking back on that experience and folks can read about kind of the narrative of it in the book and you'll meet the patients and the doctors and all that. I mean, I changed their names, of course, but, but you'll meet everybody. Um, the, the best thing I can say about that experience is it was very intense. There were a lot of things that, you know, I saw there and, and the people that I met there that, you know, it's difficult. It's not an easy spot. I mean, you, you came to visit me while I was there. Um, and it's a tough place. It's a tough place to spend 15 minutes in. It's 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 a difficult spot to spend uh, a week or or in some cases longer for some of my my fellow patients. But listen, um, I had no phone. I had no contact with the outside world except for a pay phone that was supervised by by the staff and that sort of thing. Um, I had very little privacy because we had these 15 minute suicide checks, um, you know, four times an hour. But um, I had time to think about myself. I had time to think about my life. I had group therapy, you know, three times a day and, and the ability to really talk about issues that were, were, were problematic for me and, and to hear my fellow patients, you know, who would, Sorry, please. Um, you know who would come up to me after they would hear me speak at a group uh, and just talk to me, you know, without trying to provide care or, or you know psychiatric counsel. But you know, these are people, a lot of cases, 10, 15, 20 years older than me, and they would look at me and just say, "Please don't, don't let it happen. You know, don't get figure out a way to get unstuck because you know you don't want to be sitting here at 60 like I am. You don't want to be here." Um, it's not late. It's not too late. So, no, so I'll, I'll give you a moment here. Um, you, you go through the experience, which is not easy. I mean, none of, none of, nothing of what you've said today was easy. Um, it's all very personal, right? These are, you know, most people don't share these thoughts with other people. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of people who are going to, you know, crack open this book. They're going to buy it because they know you, 
Yeah. Um, and they're gonna be like, Oh my gosh, I, I had no idea. Um, <laughs> this guy was such a mess. <laughs> um, I say yeah. that lovingly, but, but what compels you then to actually capture all of this into a narrative? You know, what, what compels you, you know, what, what tipped the scale, so to speak, to, actually write your story and and share it with others why was that so important for you yeah that's a good good question um well you know it's been my god it's been two and a half years something like that since since i got out of the hospital and and then you know people will know if they read the book that it it was it was a week at uh inpatient intensive inpatient care and then it was nine weeks after that at a different hospital for outpatient care which was also very impactful and very important for me um why well, write about it you know i think i had a semblance of a journal in in the book uh, pardon me in the hospital that i that i kept and then i don't you remember this uh when i got out of the hospital i called you up because you were do you've been doing this podcast for a number of years and i said hey i don't really want to publish this <laughs> but i want to i want you to interview me about my time in the hospital and i mean this is like days after i got out and i think we did that it was a couple hours uh, and and nobody will ever hear it <laughs> but um, I remember telling you, I don't want to forget this, you know, cause time, time has a way of, of, uh, kind of making things better or making you second guess how bad you think things were. And then you kind of rationalize it and you do the little cognitive dance. Right. And then all of a sudden it becomes less of a big deal. I, I didn't want that to happen. Um, and so you and I spent two hours in relatively pretty exhaustive detail uh, about my time in the hospital. So it was a combination of, of that interview process. And then the notes that I had taken in the hospital where I just started like putting it down on paper. And, you know, there's something cathartic about writing it out, expressing it, even if nobody ever reads it, you know, I mean, I did some of this stuff in the hospital where you just sort of write and, and you get it out so it kind of started that way. It's just kind of this cathartic exercise. And and that's most of what it was. And all of a sudden, like I turn around and a year and a half later, it's 100,000 words of like a big blubbering mess um, that I had. Um, but, you know, I, I guess why why make it public i didn't want to at first i was very hesitant and i went back and forth with it i you know maybe there's this is valuable maybe this will help somebody out but jesus do i really want to tell people like what i was going through and do i really want to kind of strip naked for the world kind of thing um and in this past summer and th this is kind of the this is the, the moment where I decided that I just, I had to, I had to get this out there. Um, one of my, uh, person I know very well, I don't want to get too specific. He, he reaches out to me and he says, Hey, uh, having a problem. And, and he, he had known about my hospitalization and, and knew that I had been in therapy for several years. And, and he said, uh, I haven't talked to you about somebody in my family because I got a problem and he's got a problem and he's really started to, to sink pretty deep into a deep depression. And he's very, you know, this person he's talking about is a very successful guy, very, very wealthy guy, very well known in, in his industry and, and his community, you know, beautiful wife, great kids, the whole, you know, the whole package. So I said, yeah, sure. Let's, let's talk about it. So I, I speak to him for about, an hour and he wants to know about the hospitalization. He wants to know about the process because he's really thinking that, that his, his brother needs, needs the help, uh, needs constant care, needs intervention. It was kind of a, a moment. And he's like, yeah, he, re he re I think he really would benefit from it. I said, well, so we have that conversation. Last thing I say to him is I say, uh, sorry, Mike. Um, I say to him, don't, um, don't let, don't let too much time go by. Don't, don't let it sit. Don't, don't let the day, you know, the hours turn into days and weeks. Just, just let, 
make sure you reach out to him. And if he needs to talk to me because he's curious about it or he's got other questions, concerns or whatever, his family wants to talk to me, please, anytime, 24 hours a day, have him reach out to me. <laughs> uh, I think it was three days later, three or four days later, uh, we got we got word that his... <clears throat> So his brother wound up taking his own life. He's gone. So, um, I'm sorry. So when that happened, it was done. It was done. Uh, the book was going to get written, and uh, and the story was going out there. That was that was it. That was that was the decision making process, and uh, and you know. What is it? January nineteenth, whatever. I think we, uh, you hit the button, and then and the book went out. So that that that's that's what ultimately tipped the scales. I went back and forth for a while, but I after that happened, I was done. So he's. I mean, it, is is that the desperate man you're thinking about when um, you know, when you're when you're shaping this and putting the the finishing touches on it? Oh yeah, and and to this day, I I still wake up, you know, two three in the morning, and I wonder like if I could have just gotten them, just just sit down with them for, for just a little bit, and you know I realize because I talked to my therapist about that, and and you know he's obviously you know counseled me not to feel, uh, you know guilt, guilty about it, but uh, hey, I I think you know what you're not going to save everybody. You're not, you know, my, my, my image of this whole thing, Mike, is you're going to dive into that pit and, and there's going to be people there who, uh, you know, who are, are struggling and you're going to try to, you're going to try to grab them and and save as many of them as you can. Um, They got to want to hold on though. They got to want to hold on to you uh, to get out of it. And, and some of them will, and some of them won't, but yeah, I, it, it, it'll it'll haunt me probably forever. I'll always I'll always wonder if there was something more that I could have done. Well, the book is "Conversation with a Desperate Man." What's the subtitle, Jim? The subtitle is "A Book for Any Man on the Brink and Anyone Who Loves Him." And of course, you as a listener can uh, read Jim's story in that book. Uh, it goes into a lot more detail than than we did here. Uh, it is available for sale at, uh, let me just look at my notes here, at uh, Amazon.com, as well as uh, any place where you can buy books online. You can, of course, go to uh, your local bookshop, ask them uh, if they can get it for you. So give throw a little love to uh, the local bookstores. They they can order it and uh, and, and get it for you if you're so inclined to uh, help the, the little guys in, in this time of need, in this time of need. Absolutely. COVID, certainly not... Um, not uh, doing any favors for small businesses uh, and, and independent bookstores um, can be counted among that. Uh, so, Jim, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, share your story on Uncorking a Story. Thanks a lot, Mike. And obviously, thanks for everything. Any any parting words uh, that you want to share with the audience before, uh, before I let you go? Yeah, if, if people, people have somebody in their life uh, uh, who they... They, they know is is having trouble and and he or she is uh, is going down a dark road um, I, I think that there's a lot of people respond to that and say hey it's none of my business I, I don't want to poke my head in where it doesn't belong you know that that's for you know him and his wife or, or she and her husband or he and his hus- husband whatever you know whatever the dynamic is that's for them to to, to worry about. I, I can't butt into that. I, I'll tell you something that is absolutely wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Of course you do everything you can and it's complicated. It's not easy to navigate. You know, you're, you're going to wind up violating somebody's privacy. You're going to wind up maybe disclosing something to somebody else about this person that they don't want disclosed. And I get it. It's not an easy thing to navigate, but you have to love the hell out of them. And and loving the hell out of them sometimes means that you're going to step on some fingers and step on some toes. But 
you'd rather step on fingers and step on toes uh, uh, than having them put something in their mouth, pulling the trigger or putting a belt around their neck. You don't want that to happen. Right. Almost, almost better to, to step on the fingers and toes and uh, not lay a, a rose on the old uh, casket. <laughs> better said than I could, Mike. Bingo. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll leave it on that one. Thank you for your time, Jim. Thanks, Mike. Well, that's, uh, that's it. That's my, the end of my conversation with Jim. I, 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 I did warn you that it was long <laughs> in part one. I, I warned you that it was deep and, uh, rarely does it get more deep than that. You know, he, he, he broke down a few times. Um, he carries a lot of weight on his shoulders. He still does carry a lot of weight on his shoulders. Um, yeah, there's no off switch here. There's no, you know, just because you go, you get help. Um, you make some tough decisions and, uh, you live with consequences, but there's no off switch for, for, um, anxiety and depression and, and his tendencies to, to carry that responsibility, particularly that story about, um, uh, his, his colleague's brother who ended his life. Um, I know that's going to weigh on Jim for a very long time. And, um, there's, there's not much I can do about that, but, um, I'm, uh, I will tell you this. I'm, I'm very proud of my brother. I'm proud that uh, he faced what he had to face. I am proud that he asked for help. I'm grateful and thankful that he asked for help. Um, honored that he asked me for help. And, um, you know, also very proud of him for, for becoming vulnerable and, and sharing his story you know, in the form of a book with other people. It, none of this is easy. You know, it's very, and, and you know, I know that you, there's some male stereotypes out there, but it's very difficult for you know us as men to become vulnerable, to admit that we have, you know, the need for help, you know, to talk about our feelings. Have you ever tried to get us to talk about our feelings? I mean, come on, it's not easy, <laughs> you know, um, but he did it. He, he did so with a lot of courage. Um, and um, I guess that's the one word I'd use to describe my brother these days is, is courageous. He, uh, you know, went through some shit, <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, came out on the other side and his book is, is, is a very, um, it's a very good read. I will say this. I've read it a couple times and very hard to read for me personally. Um, but, uh, it, it is very good. It, it is worth your time. And, uh, you know, like, um, like the tagline said, not the tagline, but the subtitle says, you know, a book for any man on the brink and anybody who loves him. Um, it's a it's a good read. I encourage you to go out and buy it. Buy it for yourself. Buy it for a friend. Uh, you could do so on Amazon. You could do so at any independent bookstore. They'll have to order it for you, of course. Uh, it is available paperback and ebook format. Um, and uh, go ahead and order that baby. Order it now. Do it. <laughs> I usually don't pitch books that hard, but I do have a lot of uh, belief and, and faith in this one. So listen, thank you for, for listening to uh, part one and part two of my episode with Jim Carlin. If you liked what you heard, please consider sharing it with a friend. We love to grow uh, listenership. We, um, we have been growing uh, recently. Uh, the past two months, uh, we're, we're up a hundred percent in terms of, uh, in terms of listening listeners. So uh, let's, let's keep that trend up. And, and the best way to do that is, to uh, have our listeners share it with friends. Also, uh, if you like what you hear, please uh, consider leaving a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts and uh, subscribe. You know, that way you stay up to date with all of the uh, great Uncorking a Story content that is forthcoming. So uh, from all of the hardworking men, women, and canines here at Uncorking a Story, this is Mike Carlin saying thank you very much for listening and we'll talk to you next week.